Hello everybody, I'm Amy G. I'm so excited to be back to host the second segment of Women in Conversation at Home. Our goal is to inspire our audience by highlighting topics of interest and importance to women in Sonoma County. And this episode focuses on the joy and love that animals bring into our lives. I'm so excited. For the past six years, Summit State Bank has helped us to introduce many diverse and amazing women. Their own personal stories have entertained us, moved us, and inspired us. On behalf of the staff of the Press Democrat and Summit State Bank, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us. I'd also like to take a moment to thank those that have made this night's feature possible, presenting partner, Summit State Bank, and founding partner, Providence. These two organizations have supported women in conversation from the very beginning. Their consistent participation has helped to develop and evolve the program and their financial support, well, it's been vital to its continuation and growth. We also send out a big thank you to supporting partners, North Coast Tile and Stone, Montgomery Village, and Oliver's Market please support these businesses as they have so graciously supported this series and made this very special evening possible for all of us. So there's been a pet boom since the pandemic and rightfully so animals can provide much needed comfort and companionship during difficult times, which this has been. And in this segment, we will be celebrating a few women and how their lives have been enriched by finding that special bond with animals and also how they give back and share their passion with others in the community. But before we meet our ladies, Let's welcome back one of our favorite ladies, Dusky Estes, and see what cocktail recipe she's cooked up and she's gonna be sharing with us this evening. Dusky Estes of Farm to Pantry and Black Pig Meat Co. for another episode of Backyard Mixology with Women in Conversation. And this week, it's all about your dogs. Uh, so I named this cocktail after my dog, Archie, who if you're a Facebook follower of my husband, every day he posts a different wacko position that my dog got himself into. So uh, today we're gonna make a cocktail for me that I named after Archie and a cocktail for our two dogs named after our other dog, Blackie. So if you wanna make a cocktail for your dog, the kind of fruits you could incorporate are strawberries, watermelon, bananas, apples, and cantaloupe. So today I'm gonna make a cocktail for the dogs uh, called um, the Blackie with watermelon and strawberry and a little bit of water. It's, it's really a mocktail. But mine, on the other hand, is all about getting yourself into a little bit of trouble. Uh, right now in Sonoma County, we are gleaning with Farm to Pantry citrus. And so we're gleaning lots of grapefruit, which of course goes perfect with a little tequila. So we're gonna make a, a version of the Paloma uh, that I call the Archie because I add a little bit of spice to it, both in my salty rim and in a piece of jalapeno if you wanna put it in your shaker. So we're gonna start off uh, with a little bit of ice in the shaker. And when I was researching about cocktails related to dogs, there are many. Uh, there is one that is called uh, the Salty Dog, another called the Mad Dog, another called the Pomeranian, the Pink Poodle, the Golden Labr Labradoodle, I think. Uh, there, there's endless names of cocktails related to dogs. So we will start with a little bit of ruby grapefruit and a half a lime into our shaker with a little piece of jalapeno if you like, but if, it, if spice is not up your alley, you don't have to put that in. So a half a lime. A 
bunch of grapefruit. And of course, because we're in my backyard today, you're gonna get to hear trees being cut down, roosters choosing to join us. Maybe my cat will join. We got lots of animals out here. Some sheep, some goats, some pigs. You never know who's coming to your party. And I just want to shout out to Mark Pasternak at Devil's Gulch because he was who provided us with Archie that is communicating right now. Uh, and he is the life of the party. So we've got our grapefruit, our lime, and now it's time to add a little bit of booze. So we're going to start with two ounces of tequila. and a half an ounce of whatever is your favorite orange liqueur. So triple sec or Cointreau, mine is, the, is this one. All right, now we're gonna start to shake. Okay. And now it's time to salt our rim. And so because I like a little bit of heat with this cocktail, I add one of my new favorite ingredients. It's called chili crack. And you can get it at Oakville Grocery or you can get it at Trader Joe's among other places or I'm sure you could order it online. So I take my salt and I take a little chili crack which is basically chili oil mixed with toasted garlic and onions. So it's got this great crunch that it adds to the rim of your salt. So we take a little spent lime. Where did I put my spent lime? I don't know, but a little lime to get the salt on my rim. All right, a good shake. And then just strain it in. And I like to serve it on the rocks, so I'll add a little bit of ice. And then I garnish with some rosemary flowers from my garden. So there is your Archie. And now it's time to make the Blackie, which is the cocktail for the dogs. It's really a mocktail. So we're gonna take a little bit of watermelon and strawberries and a little bit of water. Okay, here's my water. Now we're ready for Archie and Blackie. Come on, it's your time to join me in the party. Okay, here, where's my strainer? Okay, they're gonna love this mocktail so that we can celebrate together. So you guys ready? Blackie's here, come on Archie. Blackie is ready. Blackie, give me five. Come on, give me five. Good job. Here's your mocktail. Archie, wanna give me five? Yeah, there you go, Arch. Here's a little toast to my, my lovely dog pals. Happy Women in Conversation. Yum. They're actually loving this mocktail. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>
Now let me introduce our main segment on how animals bring such joy to our lives. I know how much my dog Ezzy has brought to mind, and I'm so excited to learn more and talk with each of these ladies about their personal connection with pets and how they share that with others in the community. Animals, they bring so much joy into our lives. And this year we have seen a substantial increase in families looking to adopt or foster a new pet. We have all found ourselves with more time at home sheltering in place, and many of us have been working and attending school at home as well. What a wonderful time to bring a new furry family member into our lives. Shirley Zendler has been an animal lover all her life. She was an animal control officer for most of her career and has been loving and caring for animals for over 30 years. She thrives being able to bring an injured animal back to health or help a traumatized one recover. In 2015, she decided to expand on her passion by founding Dogwood Animal Rescue Project, which is a foster-based volunteer nonprofit in Santa Rosa. Their focus is on the rescue and placement of animals into safe, nurturing homes. Dogwood relies on its team of over 200 volunteers who help with fostering, vet appointments, transportation of rescue animals, fundraising events, and administrative duties. It really does take a village. Gail is now one of the volunteers at Dogwood, but her story starts before that. I never could have imagined how my life would change and how much love and joy Honey, my little multi-poo, would bring to me. Honey had a hard life before we met. She was left in a box in the hot August sun with many ailments at an animal shelter weighing only four pounds. I was living a few hours away when I lost my husband. I wanted to be closer to Dogwood so I could volunteer more. So I up and moved with my little dog, Carly, to Sonoma County. I was only here a few months when Dogwood took in little Honey, and I fell in love with her instantly. She is a fighter, and I just knew when I saw her that she was the one for me. She filled that hole in my heart and bonded with me in one day. It was meant to be. And through Shirley, I have finally found my purpose in life. Both Shirley and Gail's passion for making a difference shows. Dogwood has rescued and placed thousands of dogs and cats into new homes, bringing their owners companionship and unconditional love. I'm so excited to be a part of this Women in Conversation because it's all about the joy of pets and our panel is amazing. Everybody gets to meet Shirley Zendler. She is the founder of Dogwood Animal Rescue Project. And Shirley, let's just start with how this came to be and what exactly your organization does for animals in Sonoma County. So it started out, I was an animal control officer, longtime rescue person on a smaller scale. And in my job as an animal control officer and working in a shelter, um, I saw so many times where my, my job as an officer didn't directly address the need in the community and the shelter couldn't quite address it as well. And I was bringing home, you know, animals needing bottles overnight or animals needing special care. I was helping people with their um, vet bills because they wanted to take better care of their animals and couldn't afford spay and neuter, that kind of thing. And so I ended up uh, getting together with a fabulous group of people that um, have really helped make Dogwood Rescue what it is today. And we rescue mainly dogs and cats in desperate need and find homes for them. And a lot of times they're severe medical cases, moms with newborns, um, you know, broken bones, that kind of thing, needing surgeries, needing a lot of special care. Other times they're just people's pets that someone passes away or they can't care for anymore and we take them in and find homes for them. And then we also have an affordable spay neuter program because we really can't rescue our way out of overpopulation. There are more animals than homes and there's more being born every day, especially right now in the spring. So by providing animal owners a, an affordable option for spay and neuter and helping get that done, we are saving far more lives than we could ever save by taking them into our rescue. So give us a little insight what a day 
in your life is like, how many animals are you tending to each day? You know, what's full capacity at your shelter? Uh, is there ever any quiet time in your life? <laughs> <laughs> there is very little quiet time. Um, we usually run between 60 and 100 animals in our program. Now we're foster home based, so they're not all with me. Um, we usually have about 40 dogs and 20 to 40 cats, but it can, it can get higher than that occasionally. Um, and again, they're, they're spread throughout the county and even a little beyond in foster homes. At my home, I usually have 10 to 20 dogs, maybe that many puppies, some cats and kittens. Uh, a typical day, like my day this morning, started probably at 6.30 a.m., um, you know, letting all the dogs out. I've got a mom with a three week old litter. I've got a mom with a newborn that I had to rush into the vet this morning for some emergency surgery. Uh, a bunch of other dogs needing exercise. I did an adoption visit this morning, back and forth to the vet and then on with you guys. Love that. That's a busy day. That's a very it always busy. is. I know. So, you know, part of why this conversation is happening is because there's been such a rise in adoption of pets over the pandemic, a huge surge. And I would just like to know kind of how your, you know, your line of work has changed during the pandemic. And also I'm sure there's a lot of vetting involved when you're about to place an animal in somebody's home. And how do we avoid this not being a trend because we're in a pandemic and a bunch of people went and got an animal. And then if they end up going back to work and that that animal continues to get the care that it needs. You know, it's a tricky balance, certainly. I mean, for some people, they're going to be they're going to be working at least partially from home, hopefully long term. But one of our questions in our adoption uh, counseling is what happens when you go back to work? How do you make it work? Mm -hmm. um, you know, your dog's used to having you home all the time. They're going to be upset. They're maybe going to bark or have behavior issues. So we talked to our adopters ahead of time about that, you know, pretty in detail. And animals have to come back to us if they cannot, you know, if they can't stay in their home. It's not all about just, you know, getting the animals out the door. It's about, hey, we need a long term, you know, home for this animal because we're going to have to take it back. We're going to want to take it back if it doesn't work out. And um, we also offer a lot of support as people, you know, when they adopt from us. So uh, I'll do free consults, behavior consults. Uh, the rest of my team is helpful too for, you know, when things come up, uh, helping the dog adjust to the owner being gone. You know, cats usually have an easier time, of course. But, uh, and, and we've, we've worked really hard over the past year to try to um, help people, uh, you know, to, we need to both be safe when doing adoption visits with COVID and also um, to help people, you know, fill that void that we're filling when we're not out doing all the things that we used to do. And that's where animals are such a gift. They're just a gift to us to be able to, um, to be our companions and our friends and our entertainment and so much more when, you know, when we're home and everything's so different, it's, it's a, it's a strange time in most of our lives. And, and the animals are such a, a gift to so many. That's such a great segue to my next question because they really are a gift. And, and as the our dog was a rescue and I cannot imagine life without her now. And we've had her now for five years, uh, but being a gift, you're around these animals day in, day out. It is your work. It's your labor of love. You have to bond with these animals and connect with them. And yet you also have to say goodbye to them. How do you balance that? You know, it's such a great question. And I, and I even tear up thinking of it because I do get so attached. I mean, I love these animals. I, I have them in my home like my own and I treat them like my own. But every single day, our organization gets 10, 20, 30 requests to take animals in desperate need. In many cases, it's a shelter saying we have to euthanize this animal by five o'clock today because we are out of space or it's an animal that is in desperate need of surgery. And if we don't provide it, the animal's gonna be euthanized because there's in pain, they're in pain and nobody else can take them. And that is such a powerful motivator for me to let go of whatever foster I'm crazy in love with at the moment and let them go to their new home and then to welcome and be able to save the next one. And, you know, my household is, is full of animals. Like the, the animals that I care for deserve to have more one-on-one -on -one attention than I can give them long-term. Um, certainly I give them everything I have when they're with me, but um, they, they do great. You know, most of them do really well and uh, it's very bittersweet and they leave. I've shed more than a few tears when, when some of them go, but uh, it, then it's onward to save the next one. 
I love that. They give us such a gift of compassion. The last question I want to ask is I'm sure that your, your organization has to survive off of volunteers and help. So if people watching this are interested either in adopting or working with your organization and volunteering, what would you like them to do? So following our Facebook page is a great way to see what we're doing. Uh, we update every day with, with everything that's going on, uh, Dogwood Animal Rescue Project on Facebook. Uh, we also have a website uh, where people can donate. They can sign up to volunteer. We're not training a lot of volunteers during COVID, uh, and we do have a big big volunteer pay base, but we're, we're still training some. And, uh, you know, a long time ago when we started this organization, I said to my board, if people help us a little, we'll do a little. And if they help us a lot, we'll do a lot. And they have helped us beyond our wildest dreams. People have been so kind and generous. And the more I do rescue, the more I love people because we have had those people step up and make up for, you know, the, the bad and the heartbreak we see. We've got such a great team of people trying to make it better. I love that. Well, Shirley, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We're going to catch up with you later on the group panel, but that is Shirley Zendler. She is the founder of Dogwood Animal Rescue Project. Make sure you follow her on Facebook and find her website so you can uh, go check out man's best friend and woman's best friend. It should be really be woman's best friend for this conversation. And uh, I'm so envious that you get to work with those animals all day long. Lots of compassion going on. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. How exciting would it be to live on a ranch full of rescued animals? Well, that's just how Lynette Lyon grew up, on Lyon Ranch in Sonoma, surrounded by pets. Starting at a young age, Lynette went on many adventures to help and bring home animals of all kinds in need around Sonoma County and beyond. She has followed her passion. Lynette is now an exotic animal trainer runs the family therapy program, and carries out many of the day-to-day -day operations of the ranch, not to mention caring for the more than 65 animals that call Lion Ranch home. Animals have a way of accepting people without qualification. Animals don't mind how someone looks or speaks. An animal's acceptance is non-judgmental, forgiving, and uncomplicated. The Lion Ranch has taken in unwanted, neglected, and abused animals for more than two decades. During normal times before 2020, they took many of the animals to senior facilities, hospitals, and schools for animal-assisted therapy. The animals entertain everyone and don't have a concept of embarrassment. From young to old, everyone welcomes them and the knowledge and stories that Lynette brings when she introduces them. These therapy animals are not what you'd expect. Can you imagine the surprise when you see Kisa, the 1800 pound camel, Chewy, the fennec fox, and Muppet, the mini horse that has learned to trot from person to person in search of pats and treats. It's just as much fun for the animals as well. You'll see them show off and try to get extra attention and love from their very intrigued audience. Lynette has pivoted during this past year and has been using Zoom to surprise corporate workers on teleconferences with cameo appearances from some of the rescuees. She is hoping to make this a part of the ranch's new programming. Though not the same as personal touch, it will allow more groups to experience the mood-boosting benefits associated with animals. You're in for a treat because Lynette Lyon, well, she started this interview and, and the bird on her shoulder, he gave her a little present and she's still sitting with us. She's a true gamer. As you guys know, I use that terminology in Giants baseball. Lynette, I'll let you explain what the bird did, but first let me introduce you. She's the outreach coordinator for Lion Ranch and your whole world revolves around all kinds of different animals that do all kinds of stuff to you. So introduce us to your friend and what just happened. <laughs> Well, so first of all, of course, I work with about 65 different animals and over 25 different species, and they're always going to do something that I don't necessarily want to have happen. And so in this case, she pooped down my back. Um, you got to go. 
you gotta go. You gotta go. You gotta go. Yeah. That's one of the possibilities if you have exotic animals or, you know, animals that are not true domestics, then potty training is questionable at best. And best. I love this. I love how we opened this. And you really are a gamer person through this with us. Thank you. So you have such an interesting position. Tell us a little bit about these exotic animals at Lion Ranch and what your job is as an outreach coordinator. How are you utilizing these animals in the community? Originally, it started strictly as a rescue. We would take in like a dog or a cat from neighbors or from, you know, families in the community that couldn't take care of them as sort of a final destination home. We don't rehome. And then it started to grow and expand when we began to take animals to visit patients in nursing homes and hospitals. So we decided, well, we decided I was 10. Uh, we decided we would get something a little more unusual. And that's when we got our first camel and to take in to nursing homes and hospitals. And it just snowballed from there. So now 65 animals later, we have everything from like, we have skunks, we have foxes, we have parrots, we have a pig, we have camels, we have a hybrid zebra, uh, just to name a few. And so not all of those visit people. But I was wondering... I was wondering about the skunk. <laughs> Actually, so it's the Z-donk. Like we definitely can't take him into nursing homes and hospitals, but the skunk, people aren't allowed to pet her, but visually and just from a, a speaking standpoint, she is really fun to talk about. And so I absolutely take her to visit classrooms. I take her to visit nursing homes, hospitals, uh, even like corporate stuff occasionally. It's really fun. So I think that there's just kind of a, a universal understanding that animals are interesting. You know, I remember as a kid in schools, the somebody from the zoo would come and bring a snake or some type of reptile, but you've tapped into this niche of therapy with animals. And what have you found about their ability to soothe us, not just in the people you visit, but during this past year of the pandemic? So overall, the idea of just soothing as a therapy is a little bit of a, it's a very common misconception, especially when it comes to our focus group of Alzheimer's and dementia patients, where the benefits of soothing don't necessarily outweigh the benefits of stimulation, mm -hmm. especially safe stimulation. And since, yeah, anim animals are an interesting and universal constant, taking an animal into a situation with someone who has dementia or Alzheimer's is fascinating because they are still interested in the world, regardless of whether or not you can immediately see it. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, this past year, we've been very limited in our capabilities when we used to do probably two senior facility visits a week and another two visits up here and probably two classrooms or summer camps as well. Now we can't do any. And so we've had to sort of resort to the occasional Zoom call or very limited interactions, which is disappointing because a big part of that stimulation is the physical interaction. That includes not just petting, but asking questions and learning about these animals. And that's much harder to do over a Zoom call, especially for a senior facility. That makes a lot of sense that they would they would serve as stimulation and that's really really interesting so you as an individual i mean you're like an anomaly to me because you seem to have zero fear of any type of animal i could not be more polar opposite like i i honestly it's a dog for me maybe a cat and that's it like that's my <laughs> that's my limit uh what is it about you and at what point in your upbringing or adulthood i'm not sure when it happened did you know this is what you wanted to do, but also realize your connection to all types of animals. I have to be honest, there is one type of animal I'm not a fan of, and that's moths, because my brother used to shove them down my shirt when I was a kid, and I hated that. But other than that, um, I remember the first time I saw a rattlesnake in person was on a hike with my dad and he was so calm and collected. He's like, we don't need to be afraid of it. They're so important to our ecosystem. And I was probably like four or five, if that. And it sort of just spiraled from there into this incredible love and interest in everything that's important to 
you know, human survival, which includes taking care of our ecosystem and everyone who inhabits it. So for example, I just picked up my first rattlesnake uh, the other day to get it off of someone's property. And he's uh, chilling in the back of my car right now until I can get him up to Sebastopol. <laughs> I mean, honestly, Lynette, that might be one of my, my worst fears is to have a rattlesnake in my car. And I know my dad is going to be watching and I know he knows he would never have reacted the way your dad did if we saw a rattlesnake on the trail. So I love that your dad was able to be so calm and it kind of set the tone for, for how you are. What kind of advice can you offer to someone like myself, somebody watching who is I have a true fear of any type of exotic animal. I, you know, I, like I said, I kind of draw the line at dogs and cats and, and then I, I, I have a reaction. I, I'm very afraid. It's important to remember with dogs and cats, those are a true domestic animal. They have been our partner, uh, our partners for approximately 20,000 years. I mean, those are animals that we are instinctively designed to connect with, to be interested in, and to consider important and part of our, our lifestyle and livelihood and family. So when it comes to exposing yourself to more exotic things, I would definitely start small. Um, the great news is, you know, there's a lot of different smaller programs like mine where instead of, I'm not gonna just like bring a rattlesnake in, I'm not gonna bring in like a 14 foot python in, but then I have a little snake called a rubber boa, which looks fake. It literally looks like a cartoon of a snake. It doesn't look like a real snake. And it's interesting because when I bring him out, people are like, oh, that, that doesn't even look like a real snake. It just you know looks like a toy snake. And so that kind of exposure therapy where you're like 10 feet away from this animal that definitely cannot hurt you that that feels a little better that's like well you know he definitely can't do something to me um but I also never try and force someone to you know interact with an animal they really are genuinely afraid of and it, it happens and I don't see the purpose in distressing someone because I feel like anyone can have appreciation for an animal even if you're afraid of it and Absolutely. I feel like respect that so I don't think we need to make it more negative by just, right. oh, we got to expose you. You've got to love this animal. You don't. <laughs> I'm very appreciative if they're over there and I'm right here. <laughs> but I'll, maybe I'll work with you on getting a little more comfortable. And I would love for you to tell folks if they were interested in, uh, you know, tapping into your service, whether that's through a Zoom now in the pandemic or as things start to open up, how would they go about meeting some of your exotic animals? As things are opening up, we are doing more in-person work, which is our focus anyway. And so you can find our information on our website, which is lionranch.org. Uh, you can also look into our Instagram, which isn't Lion Ranch, it's actually wild underscore lives underscore, but it's still the Lion Ranch um, Instagram. And so you can reach out there, but all of our information is actually on our website, including our phone number and our email address. Wonderful. Well, I'm very envious of what you what you do and what you're able to do. And I'm going to work on getting a little more comfortable. And we're going to let Lynette go clean up. Lynette Lyon, she's the outreach coordinator for Lion Ranch. And we'll see you back on the tail end for the panel discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Imagine not being able to hear a fire alarm or a neighbor knocking on your door. Imagine worrying that you would constantly miss important sounds. Now imagine overcoming these barriers and gaining independence with the help of a canine companion's hearing dog. High school special education teacher Patty Ruotolo was born with bilateral hearing loss and uses a hearing aid in one ear and an external cochlear implant in the other. At night, when she removes her hearing devices, she can't hear anything. 
In 2017, prior to being matched with Sierra, the Sonoma County wildfires left Patty scared and she started searching for a hearing dog that could give her the security she was looking for. Patty was matched with canine companion's hearing dog Sierra in 2019. The funny thing is, she had never had any pets, but now she can't imagine her life without one. This past year, Patty has relied on Sierra for a lot. Since we haven't been able to gather in our social networks with friends and family, the timing was perfect. Patty matched with Sierra before shelter in place, and for that, she is very thankful. Each service dog spends its first year and a half learning commands and socializing, then goes on to a training program for six to nine months before being matched with a person with a disability. Patty and Sierra have found their perfect match, and I believe Patty has found her best friend. Sierra is expertly trained to alert important sounds in Patty's environment, including someone knocking on the door, smoke alarms, alarm clocks, the sound of her keys dropping, her name being called, and many more day-to-day -day sounds that most of us take for granted. Sierra helps Patty live more independently, knowing she's less likely to miss important sounds with Sierra by her side. These two are quite the pair, and we are thrilled to share her story of newfound love and a new beginning. Well, for our last uh, guest for Women in Conversation, Joy of Pets, I'm really excited to meet Patty Rutolo and her dog, Sierra, and she's her hearing dog. Patty is hard of hearing, and you were able to partner with Canine Companions fairly recently to receive Sierra. And this is a really special subject and something I'm really glad that we're opening up and discussing because you had not had a, a, a hearing dog for your life until you encountered issues in 2017 with the fires. And I was hoping that you would share that story and how that was this impetus to getting, uh, getting Sierra. Yeah, um, the fires were a very scary time for a lot of people, right? And um, when I had woken up during the night and saw Facebook blowing up, I became really nervous because I was alone. And my son who lived part-time with, with his father was there at his father's place, so I was alone. And I just didn't know how I was gonna know whether I needed to evacuate or not. How was I gonna hear the you know, the doorbell, door knocking, the sirens, the, the you know, whatever I need to hear, the smoke alarm, the fire alarm. Um, and so I was really nervous about it. And a friend of mine had kind of, after that suggested, you know, why don't you get a, you know, hearing service dog? And so that kind of pushed me in that direction. And that's um, because the hearing dog can alert me to all those very important sounds yes. that I wouldn't hear at night because I take off my hearing devices. So I'm deaf at night. And so um, that's how we went in that direction. It, and it's just fascinating. I, I, when you're living a life hard of hearing, there's a lot of things that happen in your world that in a hearing person's world, we don't even think about. And one of the things that really stuck out to me, Patty, was you can't hear if you've dropped your keys. So little things like that, or your sunglasses or whatever it is. Can you share a little bit about the challenges you have faced being hard of hearing and how Sierra has uh, helped you transition into being more independent and helping you with those things? Absolutely, Amy, that's a, that's a great example. I have lost keys so many times uh, in my life way before Sierra where I dropped him and I didn't hear him. And then, yeah, what a, it's just a... Um, very frustrating and upsetting to have that happen. So with Sierra, it's wonderful. She um, alerts me when I drop my keys. And so she, you know, taps my leg and then she goes, I say, what? And she shows me what it is and she goes to the keys on the ground. So, um, so that's wonderful. And she, um, what other things? There's so many things that I miss. And she, at my job teaching at the high school, they changed the bell system. Before I had no problem hearing it, but the way they changed the bell to this new bell found, I don't know, it just, sometimes I don't hear it. So Tio would alert me every time. You know, I had to train her a little bit, not much. I mean, she picked up everything very fast. Um, and so I would alert her to the school bell too. 
I love that. And I love that it gives you some sense of independence in your life because you're so deserving of that. So let's talk a little bit about canine companions because there is a high demand for hearing dogs and it's, it's, you know, there's not probably not enough for as many people who need them, but can you share what the process was like and how you got selected? Well, Canine Companion for Independence is an amazing organization. They are just incredible. And I'm so thankful that I would match with them and that I would, that I would match with Sierra and that I got to work with Canine Companion. They, um, and they're right here in our backyard in Santa Rosa. And a lot of the locations, are, they have locations all over the U.S., but you could still have to drive hours to get to them. So I'm so grateful that they were in my backyard in Sonoma County. Um, the process is, you know, paperwork with the doctor, doctor verifying your disability and whatnot, and then interviews with canine just to get to know you and you get to know them and tour of their beautiful campus in Santa Rosa. And then once you, there was a waiting period, I had to wait um, a while. And um, once I got on campus, they contacted me for training a two week training and I got to stay on a beautiful campus, very welcoming, friendly and professional staff and staying there was just actually with a once in a lifetime experience. And it's one I'll never forget because I've never had the opportunity to be in a group with other professional deaf hard of hearing people. And there were six of us and we were all professionals, nurses and professors and doctors. And I have never had that experience. And so the whole experience was just amazing and I'll never forget it. I bet. Are you still in touch with the group that you were at the campus with? Yes, that was the group I was on the campus with. There were six of us. I, do you still talk to them today and 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 stay in communication? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Especially that right after. Especially right after, you know, we were texting and stuff. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, that's really interesting. So uh, this was kind of funny that we found something out about Patty that Sierra is not just a first for her in aiding with uh, being uh, uh, hard of hearing, but your first animal in your life. So how has that transition been to having an animal be part of your daily routine? Oh, it's been great. And the um... It's true. I'm my age. I'm not going to tell you my age. And I've never had a pet before. And um, so, but I have to tell you, excuse me, the training at Canine Companions was so, excuse me, thorough. And and the instructor, Ken Reed, and all the staff was so wonderful that I was a little nervous about going home with the dog for the first time. But I, it was so well done that I was totally comfortable since I got home, not only knowing how to work with a service dog, but how to take care of a dog because they really cover everything from you know grooming to cleaning to self-care, self-care for the dog <laughs> mm-hmm. and you know just everything. And so I was immediately comfortable. My last question before we let you go and bring in the rest of the panel for Q and A is just, what would you tell people who are hard of hearing and thinking about getting a hearing dog? Uh, why should they do it? And do you have to kind of divvy up when Sierra is treated as a pet versus treated as a she's working? Okay, so the first part of your question is don't wait. I wouldn't hesitate to wait. I know if you're like me, I was a little worried about the, um, did I have to take her absolutely everywhere? You know, that responsibility. And no, you don't, you don't have to take them absolutely everywhere. And, um, but the fact is she adds so much joy to everybody's life. I mean, people are always smiling and happy to see her, especially my students and my, and the uh, staff at my high school um, of this thrill to have, you know, have her around. Um, The second part of your question was, So Sierra as a hearing dog, she's kind of always working because she always has to alert me to sound. So even if we're sitting home snuggling on a couch watching TV Mm -hmm. and the doorbell rings, she's going to alert me. Or even if I have her in a down position and I tell her to stay, but she hears something, she knows that's her job, she will still alert me. Um, We obviously have plenty of fun. We we play fetch and we snuggle and she had a great life. (laughs) 
I bet she does. I bet she does. It's an absolute pleasure to have you, Patty Rutolo, and lots of wonderful information about canine companions and why you should not wait to get a hearing dog if you are hearing impaired. Thank you so much for your time, and we'll see you on the backside for the panel Q&A. Thank you, Patty. Okay, thanks, Jamie. It's my pleasure to welcome back all of these fabulous ladies from our Women in Conversation Joy of Pets. We have Shirley, Lynette, Patricia, and we cannot forget Miss Sierra, the cutest dog ever. And ladies, I, I feel remiss that I didn't ask you in our individual interviews, but I have to ask since this is about pets to each of you, what's your biggest pet peeve? And Patty, let's start with you. Patty, let's start with you. Your biggest pet peeve. Oh boy, that's a tricky one. Uh, well, pet peeves, uh, I'm kind of new to this. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it, it, I'm just learning everything. Like I'm learning how to, you know, just uh, have an animal and I'm learning how to work with a service dog in public and all that kind of stuff. And, and it, it, a challenging balance, like um, Lynette, we're talking about the going to facilities and whatnot. It's also a challenging balance with, um, training her and continuing to train her and working in public and people always wanting to you know pet her and and it's very distracting and she's trying to work and it's it's hard I mean I know people want to pet her and they're so happy to see her but at the same time she needs to work and um so it's just you know trying to find that balance I like it Shirley how about you and this can be human related too we can we can have annoyances yeah I think I mean I think it's Definitely the, the humans are trickier than the animals for sure. I think for me, you know, we take in a lot of animals that people are surrendering and, and I tend to not be very judgmental about that because people legitimately get pets thinking they're going to be able to make it work and they don't realize how challenging it is or how difficult or it's a bad match. So, you know, usually we're going to take that pet and not give them a hard time. But uh, the one that gets me is when they have an unexpected litter and they want to surrender the mom and keep a puppy mm. or a kid. And it's like, you've had this dog or cat for a year or two or five, and you don't even have a bond with it enough that you'd want to keep it as opposed to the cute little fluffy puppy. So that one, that one's always hard for me. I, you know, I always remind people, Hey, it's going to be a harder transition for your adult animal, you know, that, that you've had in your home or in your backyard for all this time. Think about keeping the adult and we'll help you get it spayed or whatever. But yeah, that's always a tough one for me. Get rid of the adult and keep the puppy. That's that's frustrating. Plus the mom just did all this work. Come on. Right? Right? <laughs> Lynette, how about you? Biggest pet peeve? Um, I think it's a really specific question that I get when I'm working a lot. And uh, it is always an adult who asks it. And <laughs> the question is, is they go, oh my God, does that bite? And like, if I have an alligator, the bush baby or parrot, be like, well, yeah, yeah, they can bite. And then the follow-up question without fail is, oh my God, does it hurt? <laughs> Probably. I mean, yes. <laughs> yeah. And then they're always really surprised by that. And I'm like, oh. You can always okay. have them just like bite themselves and see if that hurts and start there. And so if you, you know, if you bite yourself and it hurts, what do you think? <laughs> well, you know, I've had, a, I've had a response where I was like, you know, generally when someone bites or, you know, when something bites you, it's not meant to feel good. And then that got real weird real quick. So I don't use that response anymore. I understand that. I understand that. So Patty, I want to go back to you because one of the questions I had for you was specifically about advice you would give people in the public wanting to come up and pet your dog while she's working. So, you know, I know I've had that reaction to hearing dogs or seeing dogs, you know, they're wearing their, their coat or their blanket. So I know they're working. And so I specifically don't go up, but a lot of people just approach. So what's the best way to handle that situation as somebody in the public adoring your dog, what should they do? Well, um, most of uh, service dogs have some kind of vest on and usually it says something like mine says hearing dog. It also said ask to pet. 
um, of course, a lot of people don't read it or just, you know, just kind of lunge forward. And um, they, I think they can kind of tell by my body language a little bit like whether I'm going to be kind of accepting of it or not. Um, it, it, it's hard to say no, could I get it? But um, sometimes I just say, no, we're working right now. And so this is not a good time. Um, I'm sure sometimes they probably talk to me and I don't even hear them. I don't know. So whatever. But um, yeah, I did try to tell them, you know, we're working because she does get distracted easily. And so it's really hard. We have to, you know, work. She has to focus when we're working. And, um, and then sometimes when they ask, I put her in this, you know, the sitting position and I do allow them, allow them to pet if I don't feel like, you know, if I feel like it's a good time. Sure. So the best approach is to ask you. May yes. I see your dog and you'll tell them she's working or yeah, go ahead. I love but that. There are some people though with service dogs that they just do not want you to pet. And I understand that because okay. maybe they have a very serious, you know, uh, like seizures or, or diabetes or, you know, and you really need to, people need to respect that. And I think that's not get to pet all service dogs. Right. And it's really important for people to, to hear that and, and learn about that, that they are, they are not pets, at, especially while they're out, you know, with their person, they're working. So I think that's great, great advice and information for people to absorb. Okay. Lynette and Shirley, obviously a majority of your lives is spent with these animals. So I have to know, what do you do for yourself? What's an escape? And, and do you allow yourself it was 24, 24, seven job. So how do you take a break and what do you do for you? And Lynette, let's start with you. Uh, Pre-pandemic, it was Broadway musicals in San Francisco because, you know, I got to be really clean and I got to be dressed up and then I wouldn't touch anything until I like got home. Um, but now, of course, that's not happening. So it's just running. I go running every day. Great. Great. Shirley, how about you? My husband, you know, loves to go on a date with us. And so he always plans those and, and we go out and have fun together. He also plans our vacations, which I never, ever think to plan. And I always fret a bit, like trying to leave this, you know, this place for a week or more when, when he wants to plan a vacation. But I, I always make it happen because he's so supportive. And once we drive out the driveway, we have a blast. You know, we go to Hawaii or we go on a road trip or whatever, and we have so much fun together. But it's definitely hard to let go. And it's so important. I mean, we have to take care of ourselves, too, yeah. in order to, you know, continue doing the work. A hundred percent. My mom would always tell me as a mom, you, you got to take care of you first before you can take care of your kids and your husband and all of that. So that kind of translates into the animal world as well, I would assume. For uh, sure. Okay. Patricia, let's, and I, I go back and forth between Patricia and Patty. So I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll go Patty because now we're like best friends, but let's talk about pre-Sierra and post-Sierra words you would use to describe how your life has transitioned having her now in your life? Oh, how do you express? And I'm um, sure a lot of animal lovers would understand that. It's uh, immeasurable. I mean, the uh, I feel like my heart is full and just that constant unconditional love and, and companionship. And she makes me laugh and smile every day. And I see her do the same for others. And it's, she's just a joy. She's a great animal. And canine companion does an amazing job with the with the training and raising very well, um, you know, well loved, sweet dogs that are um, very smart. Yes. Very smart. And I kind of want to transfer some, from the temperament of dogs that we see come out of canine companions to what Shirley and, and Lynette are dealing with regarding rescue animals. Kind of, it's a wild card sometimes not knowing what the behavior may be or what their experience has been with previous owners. So Lynette, we touched on this a little bit about my fear and, and Shirley, I'm going to start with you actually. You know, when we got our dog, Ezzy, we got her at a shelter and she had been left somewhere in uh, Cloverdale, found on the side of a road. And we didn't know what her temperament was going to be. And I did honestly have a fear of how she was going to socialize with my children and how she was going to socialize with other dogs on walks and going downtown Petaluma, all of that. We got really lucky, but for your world, Shirley, 
what do you tell folks that are like, well, I'm worried it's a rescue dog and it, we're not sure what it's going to do. You know, that there's, I'm sure there's education involved, but I think that's a pretty common fear. I think it, that's certainly a valid question. And, you know, the interesting thing is many years ago when I started in rescue, I would have said what a lot of people think it's all in how you raise them. And, and it is important. I mean, socialization, especially if an animal doesn't get handled as a baby, say a puppy doesn't get handled during that critical period of puppyhood where they're bonding with humans, they can never overcome it completely. That being said, animals are born with whatever their temperament is. And, you know, there are breed factors, you know, retrievers want to retrieve, herding dogs want to herd, but there's also many individual temperaments in that. And I had years ago, a puppy that I adopted that had had everything perfect from birth. We adopted her at eight weeks. We did everything I think quite right. And she was a high strung snappy freak her whole life. And I called her my punishment for judging people with difficult dogs. <laughs> and I've had many other dogs that I've taken in as adult dogs, some with unknown histories, some with known histories. Honestly, the best dog, probably the best dog I've ever had in a lot of great dogs was a pit bull that I took in at 11 years of age, who was horribly neglected. She was a felony humane case. Her owner went to, went to jail for his, for his role in her, her uh, lack of care. And that dog was a rock star. I mean, she was amazing. It was just her natural temperament. She was an amazing dog. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, every dog is an individual, cats as well. We can tell a lot more about an adult dog, what they're gonna be like. I mean, there's a lot of ways to tell, to get an idea, but certainly, you know, things can come up and happen. I mean, dogs are limited in how they can communicate with us. If we scare them, biting might be a normal way that they communicate to stay back or to not, not be so fresh or pushy or whatever. So, you know, it's it, anytime we bring an animal into our home, just like our human relationships. I mean, how many people have met who they think is the love of their life? They're with them for years and then something changes or then they realize they're not who they you know, thought they were or whatever. So it's always, there's always that unknown, sure. but certainly, um, you know, asking for help from knowledgeable people with, before you bring an animal in, researching breed characteristics, letting that animal settle in and go through that adjustment period, hopefully with some help and support, all can make it much more likely that it will, that it will work. And, you know, we like our adopters to adopt with the idea it's a lifetime commitment but sometimes there's just no way to tell it's completely the wrong match until you get home and live with them for a little while. Right. And that's why we're going to take that animal back and, you know, try again, if it's not the right match, the exception being if the animal ends up being truly dangerous, which is rare, but you know, that animal's not going to be put up for adoption, of course, but in general, we just, you know, we need to try again and make a better match if it's, if it's not the right, the, the right one, the first time. And I would just add my two cents from my experience. It takes patience and it takes time when you bring Absolutely. an animal in your home. They're going to do things that hadn't happened before you had an animal in your home. Chew something up. Or I remember we had shoes all over our kitchen before the dog got into everybody's right. shoe and really got into my son's shoes. And at that time he was a preteen and I'm like, well, your feet stink the most. Clearly she's into your shoes the most. Lynette, exactly. uh, I, I do want to ask you, you, you've had these really probably life-changing experiences, seeing animals and, and people who you're going to visit, whether it's a children's hospital or somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia connect. And I was hoping there was a story that may stand out that you could share that you were able to witness and, and be a part of because of what you do. I think the most remarkable one that, that stands out uh, because it was the first time I'd really witnessed something that no matter how you, how you want to see it, like a good term, Parking. Good term could be called like miraculous in a way was I was about 12. We took our camel into a very um, award for pretty severe care for Alzheimer's and dementia patients. And we visited all the patients and a lot of them were nonverbal, non-responsive, but they did. Uh, it was clear they were engaging. So that was, that was great. And then we left. And the next day we received a phone call and I remember my dad getting the phone call and it was a, a young man who had gone in to visit his mom 
about an hour after we'd left. And he said that she had been nonverbal for about two years. She hadn't recognized him, hadn't been interested in speaking with him, and he visited her every week. And that day, she knew him by name. She said hello. She asked him how he was. Um, and they had a, about a half an hour long conversation that he hadn't been able to have with her in, in about two years. And so to get that person back for just a short time, it's not so much that it was a temporary fix as that it was building some new neural pathways and very rapid succession that allowed this conversation to occur even temporarily. And so he got a half an hour with his mom that he never would have had if we hadn't been there that day, as far as we know. That is miraculous. That is. Thank you so much to our amazing panel of women. Shirley Zendler, she is the founder of Dogwood Animal Rescue Project, Lynette Lyon, Outreach Coordinator for Lion Ranch, and of course, Patty Rutolo and your beautiful dog, Sierra. You're all amazing. And it's been my humble pleasure to host Women in Conversation, Joy of Pets. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Amy. Amy. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our Women in Conversation at Home event. And thank you once again to our sponsors for making this event possible. Please remember to tune in for our next show on May 20th. You just have to visit SoCoWomenEvents.com to register. Hi, I'm Chris Anger, Senior Vice President and Director of IT at Summit State Bank, alongside my beautiful puppy, Abby. Abby brings great joy to our family and we have a lot of fun with her. We are pleased to continue our partnership with the Press Democrat. Tune in to our next episode on May 20th. We hope this evening brought you joy, strength, and fellowship.